What happens when the ultimate masters of strategy become victims of their own tactics? Let's take a trip back to the early 13th century, shall we? This is when the Mongols, led by the legendary Genghis Khan, were like a whirlwind sweeping through Central Asia and heading into Eastern Europe. Their first big target, the Khwarezmian Empire, which by 1221 was in complete shambles. As cities crumbled and fell, the Mongol forces showed no signs of slowing down. Generals Subutai and Jeba, the ultimate dynamic duo, were chasing him all the way across the Caspian Sea. Once the Sultan was out of the picture, they got the green light to explore the northern territories. And guess what they found? The Christian Kingdom of Georgia, ruled by the clever Georgie III. In no time, they turned this kingdom into a loyal vassal. But Subutai and Jebi weren't finished yet. They kept pushing into the expansive plains of Eastern Europe, diligently gathering intelligence along the way. They were on the lookout for local tribes, including the Cumans, who were enjoying life in the vast steppes beyond the Caucasus Mountains. So, what's the takeaway here? Subutai and Jebi were laying the groundwork for future Mongol incursions into Europe checking out both the strengths and weaknesses of their potential adversaries. The Cumans were fierce nomadic people on horseback, blending high-speed archery with a knack for slipping in and out of sight. These Turkic warriors practically defined hit and run, unleashing a storm of arrows while charging at full speed. If you were a Cuman, speed was your best friend, and you could make settled armies look like they were stuck in mud. The Cumans didn't just keep to themselves on the steppes, they got around. They built alliances with the Kievan Rus through marriage, suited up as mercenaries for the Byzantines and Georgians, and even converted to Christianity. For a while, they were called the Polovtsians by the Ruses and Western Kipchaks by the Byzantines. No matter what name they went by, their strength was on horseback. When the Mongols started eyeing the Eurasian steppe, the Cumans were high on their list. Not because of their land, but because of what they represented. They were the ultimate nomadic challenge. Jebi and Subutai weren't about to let any rivals roam free on his watch. To get a handle on the steppe, the Mongols needed to get the Cumans in line, one way or another. They saw the Cumans already teamed up with the Alans to form a defense against them. The Cumans and Alans held the line in the northern passes of the Caucasus for a bit, matching Mongol horse archery and mobility blow for blow. But Subutai had a clever idea. He played the shared Turkic heritage card, convincing the Cumans about how they weren't so different after all. And when he threw in the promise of splitting the loot, it was enough to sway the Cumans to abandon the Alans. That shift left the Alans' land wide open, and it didn't take long for the Mongols to break through. Right after, Subutai and his partner Jebi turned back to the Cumans with a bit of a now-it's-your-turn attitude. The Cumans who thought they'd bought time had instead unwittingly invited the storm. Their homeland was ravaged, livestock and goods taken, and their people scattered. By winter, the Mongols were firmly camped in Cuman lands, ready to keep the conquest going as soon as the season set in. Subutai and Jebi had their eyes on the fertile farmland up north and west along the Dnieper River, a region bustling with Christian cities. This was prime real estate belonging to the Rus principalities. Sure, they all shared the Orthodox faith and spoke Rus, but that didn't mean they were one big happy family. No, these ambitious lords were always looking sideways at each other, suspicious and ready to fight. By late April in 1223, the Mongols were creeping up on the Dnieper River, not far from the Black Sea, to see how these principalities would react to their threat. Meanwhile, Khan Kutin was leading a group of Cumans who were desperately seeking help from the Rus' princes. He warned his son-in-law, Mstislav of Galich, about the storm brewing in the east. Although the Mongols hadn't launched an all-out attack on Kivan Rus just yet, the devastation they had wreaked on the Cumans left the Rus' princes feeling pretty jittery. So, Mstislav called a meeting of the princes in Kiev. The Cumans showed up with gifts and some serious news letting everyone know that once the Mongols finished with them, they'd be heading straight for Rus' territory. Mstislav urged the princes to put aside their rivalries and unite. He painted a grim picture, stressing that if they didn't act, they wouldn't just be rolling out the welcome mat for the Mongols, they might also push the Cumans into the arms of their enemies, making things even worse. 
the Christian cities in the plains decided it was time to band together against the Mongol threat. Forces from all over the principalities, including Smolensk, Galich, Chernigov, Kiev, Volhynia, Kursk, Suzdal, and even the Kumans, were quickly summoned. Three key princes, all named Mstislav, came from Galich, Chernigov, and Kiev, with Mstislav Romanovich of Kiev being the most powerful and commanding the strongest army. The Rus's forces were estimated to be between 40,000 and 80,000 strong, which was double the size of the Mongol army. But most of these troops were inexperienced farmers, armed with makeshift weapons crafted from farming tools. On the flip side, the Mongol army was a professional force with sophisticated tactics, particularly their clever ability to feign retreat, to lure enemies into traps. They headed to a rendezvous point about 50 miles southeast of Kiev, where they planned to gather their forces. From there, they marched along the Dnieper River, eventually joining up with the Kuman army advancing from the south. As the Rus's troops moved into battle territory, the Mongols sent a delegation of ten envoys to propose negotiations. Little did the Rus's princes know, killing those Mongol envoys was a serious breach of diplomatic protocol, and they would soon pay an expensive price for it. In retaliation, Subutai and Jebe launched an immediate attack, not a direct one but through quick, small raids, retreating back east, making it seem like they were scared and running from the might of the Rus. The Rus troops and their Kuman's allies, giddy at the thought of victory, were eager to chase down the Mongols. They believed their foes couldn't be any more dangerous than the Kuman's. However, some leaders, like Mstislav Romanovich of Kiev, urged caution, warning that pursuing an enemy they didn't fully understand across those vast, unfamiliar plains could spell disaster. Yet, the majority favored the chase, skipping out on sending a scouting unit ahead convinced they had caught up with the Mongols. From early May 1223, under the leadership of Subutai and Jebe, the Mongols kept retreating, aiming to wear down the Allied army, cut them off from supply lines, and lure them away from familiar territory. But day after day, the Rus couldn't catch the Mongols, only finding traces of their presence fading away. This started to create chaos within the Rus's ranks, with groups moving at different speeds. In their pursuit, the Rus's commanders also made a critical mistake by failing to prepare a retreat plan or organize a regroup. After nearly two weeks, the Rus's vanguard finally caught up with the Mongols at the Kalka River by the end of May 1223. With pride on the line and encouragement from their commanders, the Rus's troops charged into battle without taking a breather, confident they could win swiftly. The Rus soldiers braced themselves, shoulder to shoulder, with no clue how the Mongols would strike next, but determined not to break formation. They were a bit on edge, worried that the Mongols might make a run for it, robbing them of a hard-earned stash of horses and loot they'd picked up across Persia, Georgia, and Azerbaijan. The pressure was on. Each of the commanders was itching to be the first to jump into the fray, each one dead set on snagging the glory, and the spoils, for themselves. Most of these guys were farm folk through and through. In the right season, these were some tough, hard-working peasants, solid muscle, and used to working long hours. But they weren't exactly what you'd call a professional army, especially coming off a rough winter without much to eat. They were more familiar with swinging a scythe in the fields or urging on an ox than they were with actual weapons. Still, hearing their commanders promise an easy victory, these farmers shrugged and lined up behind their shields, makeshift weapons at the ready. They carried whatever they could cobble together, a sword here, a spear there, a clunky club or two. You could tell they'd seen more farming than fighting. Right beside them was a line of more experienced archers and behind everyone the proud generals sat tall on horseback, watching over their men. But then, nothing happened. No battle cry, no charge. The Cumans, who were practically chomping at the bit to chase down what looked like retreating Mongols, were the first to rush across the Kalka River. Right on their heels was Mstislav of Galicia and his crew, followed by Mstislav Sviatoslavich of Chernigov and his forces. Their army advanced in four groups, with the Kumans leading as the vanguard and flank guard, followed by the main Rus forces. Meanwhile, Mstislav Romanovich of Kiev was holding back on the other side of the river a bit more cautious and not too thrilled about charging forward until he had a better idea of what lay ahead. Once they got across the river, the Cumans went after the Mongol outposts, pushing them back in all directions. 
they were feeling pretty confident, maybe a little too confident. After all, these guys were skilled archers, right at home on the steps, and were convinced they could chase down the Mongols, just like in their previous easy wins. So, with hardly a second thought, the Cumans charged forward, with the Volhinians from the 1st Division tagging right along, thrilled by this little taste of victory. If you know anything about the Cumans, you know they can be a tad impulsive. Fired up from this minor triumph, they rushed headlong into the pursuit, crossing the river with their allies from Kiev and Chernigov trying to catch up. But by the time the rest of the Ruskuman force started crossing, half their army was already over on the far side. The Mongols, meanwhile, weren't running scared. They were heading back to their main force, who were now forming up in the distance. Here's where it gets interesting. Subutai and Jebi, the Mongol generals, had this ambush all mapped out. They'd tucked parts of their army away in the forests just beyond the river, with another group stationed downstream waiting to spring the trap. Oh, and if things got messy, they had reserves lined up, ready to jump in. Subutai just sat back, watching the gaps in the Ruskuman army grow wider, knowing the perfect moment to strike was close. The day itself was perfectly sunny spring weather, so the Mongols decided to go for a silent strike approach, using only flag signals to direct their forces. When about half the Allied forces had crossed, Subutai gave the signal. Like a silent storm, Mongol archers closed in on the Rus ranks. The only sound was the faint, haunting echo of hooves on soft ground, enough to send a shiver down the spine of every Rus soldier waiting in tense anticipation. Subutai split his army into 11 divisions, each about 2,000 strong. He held five divisions in the center, flanked by three divisions on either wing. Instead of their usual hit-and-run style, the Mongols came at the Cumans from all sides with heavy cavalry. Jebe led a charge from the north, while the left wing attacked from the south. Unlike their typical skirmishing, this was a full-on assault. The Mongol horse archers and cavalry who'd been lying in wait all stealthily in the forest and along the river, suddenly poured out, trapping the Kumans and the Rus front forces in a nice tight circle. Then, with classic Mongol precision, they pivoted right over to the advancing Kievan troops. And, did it get intense? The Mongols hit them with a fierce counterattack, catching the Rus totally off guard and turning the whole scene into a bloody mess. They stopped their horses just out of reach of the Rus weapons, and from there, they rained arrows down on them. All the Rus could do was watch as their friends dropped like flies, soaked in blood, with no one close enough to fight back. No sword, no spear, no mace, nothing. Just a hailstorm of arrows, each one designed to fit only into a Mongol bow. These arrows were hardened in brine after being heated red hot, and Mongols could launch them over 200 meters. They could hit a target from 150 or even 175 meters away. They say a trained Mongol archer could fire six arrows in 10 seconds. That's some serious rapid fire. Their bows were made from wood, horn, and sinew, specially crafted to handle both compression and tension. These things packed serious punch, all while being small enough for a rider to use with ease. The steppe folks had been perfecting these bows for thousands of years, so you know they meant business. Mongol archers typically carried two or three of them, one for horseback, one for when they dismounted, and a ton of arrows strapped to themselves and their horses. The Rus horse archers were so mad they just snapped the Mongol arrows to keep them from being reused. Like, well, at least you can't shoot us with our own arrows. But then the Rus archers started shooting back, only to realize their European bows couldn't reach as far. The Mongols? Oh, they had a little fun with that. They'd chase after the Rus arrows, not to break them, but to shoot them right back. Their own bows were so versatile, they could easily use the enemy's arrows against them. Romanovich and the other princes were battered in the chaos, as the Mongols pressed in, their archery and lancers making a deadly combo. Taken by surprise, the Allies suffered massive casualties. With their commanders down, wounded or killed, they had the river at their backs, and no way out. The trap had snapped shut, front lines couldn't budge, and in the crush to escape, some were trampled under their own men, as the Mongols kept up the attack. For the Cumans, there was no way out now. In a desperate attempt to flee, they ran straight into the Galician's second line, causing even more confusion. Soon the entire coalition force fell apart, and any sense of order just evaporated. 
by the time it was over, thousands had been killed. Rus princes on their war horses, armor shining, with bright banners and crests. These European bred horses were made to show off strength, not speed or agility though. On a parade ground sure they looked impressive, but in the heat of battle the Russes had nowhere to go. When the infantry fell back, all they could do was try to escape, but these horses weren't cut out for long chases under heavy armor. Soon enough, these armored warriors were picked off by the Mongols, and one by one, the Rus lords fell. Some accounts say Prince Mstislav Romanovich of Kiev tried to join the forward units and put up a fight, but the truth is, he held back. Watching the battle collapse, he ordered his men into a defensive circle, setting up a line of wagons in a last-ditch effort to hold off the Mongols. Meanwhile, Mstislav of Galicia, seeing the other forces in full retreat, decided to abandon the battlefield altogether, leaving the rest of the army to fend for themselves. With three divisions crushed, Subutai and Jebe focused on the remaining forces. The Kievan forces, led by Mstislav Mstislavich of Galicia, tried to hold their ground, setting up behind a makeshift wagon fort and hoping to make a break west toward the Dnieper. But it was a dire situation. The Mongols rained arrows on the camp, arrows whistling through the air, cutting down anyone who tried to resist. Days blurred into each other as the Mongols tightened their grip, with a brutal precision the Kievans had never faced before. Three days in, morale was crumbling, and with nowhere left to go, Prince Mstislav agreed to negotiate a surrender. The Mongols promised no blood would be shed if they laid down their arms, and with no other options left, Mstislav took the deal. The Kievans thought they'd struck a deal with the Mongols and stepped out of their fortifications, only to be met with a nasty betrayal. The Mongols turned on them in a heartbeat, cutting down most of the surrendered soldiers and capturing the rest. Meanwhile, other Mongol troops chased the fleeing Kumans and Rus, many of whom met a tragic end in the Dnieper River, trying to swim for safety. The Mongols pursued the Rus forces all the way to the Black Sea, right back where the campaign had begun. At the campaign's end, Subutai and Jebi took their men down to Crimea to enjoy a Black Sea spring. They celebrated for days and then came one of the most chilling displays of Mongol cruelty. They invited Mstislav, a defeated Kievan prince, and his sons-in-law to be their guests of honor. They rolled them in leather rugs, laid heavy wooden boards over them and left them beneath the floor of their tent, slowly suffocating them as the Mongols sang and feasted above. This message was crystal clear. They wanted everyone to understand the price of harming a Mongol envoy. And for their soldiers, a warning. Revenge for one Mongol life lost would be merciless. The Battle of the Kalka River was a devastating blow for the Kievan Rus. They went from being a formidable force to suffering a crippling defeat that would haunt them for years. The casualties? Around 60,000 to 70,000 men, with only one in 10 soldiers returning. Russian scholars later wrote that barely anyone came back from the battle. As many as 10 princes were killed in either the battle or the ensuing chaos. This was the first time in almost a thousand years since the Huns that an Asian army had invaded Europe and completely crushed a major European force. The Cumans lost all their influence after this, with the remaining survivors fleeing to Hungary. And while the Rus took huge losses, the Mongols barely broke a sweat. Interestingly, European chroniclers didn't even know who these Mongols were. People were utterly shaken. Priests claimed Mongol success was due to black magic or divine punishment for human sin, similar to how Muslim scholars referred to them as the Devil's Horsemen. They saw them as mysterious invaders who came and vanished. Some called it divine punishment, claiming God had sent the Mongols to punish them for their sins before sending them back home. According to the Novgorod Chronicle, the Tartars left from the Dnieper, and we do not know where they came from or where they've gone. God alone knows. So. Why did the Mongols come out on top while the Rus allies faced such a tough defeat? Well, it all comes down to a few key factors that really played into their hands. First off, you had these different principalities, each with its own army, and guess what? They just couldn't get their act together. In contrast, the Mongols operated like a well-oiled machine, moving as one cohesive unit. Their leaders, like Subutai and Jebi, were masterful on the battlefield steering the fight without getting caught up in personal skirmishes. It's like they were playing chess while the Allies were still figuring out checkers. 
One big mistake the Allies made was their lack of cooperation between their columns. The Mongols chose the battlefield like pros, forcing the fight on their own terms. There's that old military saying, never fight with a river at your back. Guess what? That's exactly what the Allies ended up doing. The Mongols executed a flawless tactical surprise, pulling off a feigned retreat and ambush that took everyone off guard. And let's be real, sometimes a little bit of overconfidence can be a bad thing. The Allies got a little too cocky after scoring some easy victories against the Mongols. This sense of superiority was something the Mongols cleverly nurtured. Without that confidence boost, maybe the Allies would have played it a bit safer. And in the end, the secret behind the Mongols' success was their classic divide-and-conquer strategy. Sure, they were outnumbered overall, but they fought in a way that kept the Allies from using their full strength at once. The Mongols focused on taking down the enemy bit by bit, crushing them piecemeal instead of facing the entire Allied force head-on. In the end, it was a classic case of defeating the enemy in detail, rendering that numerical advantage of the Allies pretty much useless. So now we can answer the question we asked at the start of the video. What happens when the ultimate masters of strategy fall victim to their own tactics? Years down the line, after growing tired of Mongol domination in their lands, the Rus finally decided enough was enough. They rose up against their oppressors, but here's the twist. They used the very tactics we just analyzed in the Battle of Kalka River to take on the Mongols at the Battle of Kulikovo. The same strategies that the Mongols had perfected were now being flipped on them. The Rus learned from their earlier encounters, applying those lessons to rally their forces and launch a coordinated attack. This time, they weren't going to let history repeat itself. So, what does this tell us about the cyclical nature of warfare and strategy? Sometimes, the best lessons come from being on the losing side, and the Rus were ready to turn the tables. On April 9, 1241, near Dobre Pole, between today's Legniki Pole and Koskovici, a legendary clash unfolded, one that would echo through European history. About 7,000 men formed up on the Polish side, a mix of courage and resolve. On the left wing stood Bolesław Dipoldowicz with his assembled forces, including knights of various monastic orders, the Teutonic Knights, Hospitallers, and Templars, as well as knights from across Europe. Even miners from the Zwatoria mine rallied under his banner, ready to defend their homeland. The right wing, led by the knight Sulisław, held Czech Hungarian allies alongside the troops of Małopolska. At the center, commanding the Silesians and Greater Poles, was Prince Henry himself. Across the field, the Mongol army of around 8,000 awaited, with Orda, the brother of Batu Khan, leading the charge as he advanced through Hungary. It was a scene set for a clash that could send ripples across nations. History was about to be made, with both sides bracing for a showdown that would test every ounce of their strength and spirit. When Genghis Khan passed away in 1227, his son Ojide Khan took the reins of the Mongol Empire. After sitting back and simply enjoying the spoils of his father's conquests, he had something grander in mind. Rather than letting the empire remain a vast nomadic powerhouse, he began to shape it into a more organized and prosperous state, without losing any of its fierce, unyielding spirit. Under Ogade's direction, the Mongol conquests surged forward, pressing into central and southern China, sweeping through Central Asia, and reaching all the way to the Middle East and parts of Eastern Europe. By 1237, Batu Khan, Genghis Khan's grandson, launched a major campaign into Eastern Europe, leading an unstoppable Mongol force through Volga, Bulgaria. They claimed the Crimean Peninsula and conquered the lands of the Alans, cementing Mongol dominance across the region. In 1238, Mongol forces reached Vladimir and began a systematic campaign through the Rus's cities, capturing and devastating one city after another. Only a few, such as Novgorod and Pskov, escaped this fate by accepting Mongol suzerainty. As 1240 drew to a close, the Mongols were primed for an even more ambitious invasion, this time targeting Poland and Hungary. When envoys were sent to Duke Henry II of Poland and King Bela IV of Hungary, they were met with hostility and captured. The message was clear. Any chance for peaceful negotiation was off the table. The Mongols' bold confidence in launching a simultaneous, multi-pronged attack on both Poland and Hungary was no mere act of bravado. It was a calculated move 
rooted in strategic ambition and the unique geopolitical landscape of 13th century Europe. Hungary, in particular, stood out as their primary target. Positioned at the crossroads of East and West, it bordered key kingdoms like Austria, Bohemia, and various states of the Holy Roman Empire. This strategic location wasn't just a happy coincidence. It allowed the Mongols to take control of vital trade routes and military pathways that bridged Eastern Europe with the West. Capturing Hungary meant they could keep a watchful eye on movements across the continent and sway regional dynamics to their advantage, laying down a stronghold that would serve as a launch pad for further operations into Europe. Now, let's talk about the political landscape at the time. Europe was marked by fragmentation and disunity, ruled by local lords and smaller kingdoms, creating a ripe opportunity for a formidable military force like the Mongols to exploit these divisions. The disunity made this area not just an attractive target, but a critical piece in their grand strategy. By establishing their power in Hungary, the Mongols could deter any potential coalition that might rise up against them and secure a base for future conquests. However, the situation in neighboring Poland told a different story. The Mongol force sent into Poland had a clear mission, to dismantle any local armies that might threaten their plans in Hungary. They weren't about to leave any potential adversaries unchecked. In a world where political allegiances shifted like sand, a strong ruler could easily rally allies. The Mongols knew this all too well, and their strategy was built around not just brute force, but smart, preemptive actions. They aimed to crush any local resistance before it could even think of uniting against them. Despite operating across two different fronts, the Mongol leaders kept their movements tightly coordinated, thanks to their highly efficient courier system. Messengers traveled swiftly between Poland and Hungary, keeping Subutai informed at every turn. In a Europe tangled up in its own squabbles and power struggles, the threat of the Mongols barely registered on anyone's radar. The feudal system was so fractured that creating any lasting authority felt like trying to herd cats. When it came time to unite against a serious threat, loyalty among the ranks was as shaky as a knight's commitment to answering his lord's call to arms. If a knight decided to sit out a battle, who was going to hold him accountable? Sure, there were heavyweights like the Holy Roman Emperor and the Pope, who could have rallied the troops, but during the tumultuous years of the 1220s to 1240s, they were often too busy bickering among themselves to join forces effectively. The political landscape was a chaotic patchwork of kingdoms, each one ready to splinter apart whenever a ruler passed away, as lands were hastily divided among heirs. It didn't matter if you were as formidable as Charlemagne. Give it a generation or two, and your empire would crumble back into a collection of petty fiefdoms. Then we have Henry the Pious, the Duke of Silesia, who had a firm grip on much of Lesser and Greater Poland during his time. Henry was no ordinary leader. He was an ambitious man with dreams of donning a crown and claiming the title of king. Known for his sharp strategic mind and relentless efforts to strengthen his principality, he stood as one of the most powerful figures in Poland. Yet even a leader like Henry wasn't immune to the forces of nature, especially when those forces came in the shape of the Mongols, who surged across the land like a storm, moving faster than anyone could prepare for. Duke Henry the Pious found himself in a tough spot, staring down a fierce enemy. Knowing he needed time for his allies to come to his aid, he pulled every trick in the book to stall the Mongol advance. But by April 9th the pressure was mounting, and he realized there was no more time to waste. Holed up in his castle with an army of around 6,000 to 7,000 men, though some accounts suggest even more, Henry understood that waiting for a siege would mean certain starvation. With limited options for retreat, he made the bold choice to take the fight to the battlefield. Gathering his forces in a hurry at Lignica, Henry's army resembled a patchwork quilt, stitched together from various contingents. He could scrape together about 15,000 to 20,000 troops, but most of them were just untrained farmers, many of whom were pressed into service with little more than their farming tools in hand. A Moravian group, led by the son of the Margrave of Moravia, added some numbers, while a handful of about 70 well-armed French Knights Templar offered a glimmer of hope amidst the chaos. The backbone of Henry's army consisted of seasoned, well-armored Silesian Knights and some capable mercenaries. However, the bulk of his forces was made up of poorly equipped levies, with only a small contingent of real cavalry. You might have heard a lot about the Teutonic Knights being at the Battle of Legnica, but let me tell you, that's mostly just a tall tale. 
The legends speak of Hospitallers and Teutonic Knights rushing to the rescue, but historian Peter Jackson insists that it was mainly the Templars who showed up. Historical records indicate that their numbers were modest, ranging from just 68 to 88 skilled fighters, far from the mighty army many stories suggest. When it came to gear, European knights relied heavily on swords and spears, but they also had a mix of smaller weapons like daggers, axes, hammers, and even spades. The Polish cavalry mirrored their Western European cousins, armed similarly. Their swords ranged from 80 to 120 centimeters in length and weighed between 1.0 to 1.8 kilo. Meanwhile, their formidable spears reached lengths of 3.5 to 4.5 meters, featuring angular tips designed for maximum impact. In terms of defense, Polish knights started off with gambesons, those padded jackets worn under armor for extra protection. They later upgraded to brigandines and scale armor, which featured small, overlapping metal plates. Eventually, they moved on to hauberks, chainmail shirts that provided better flexibility and protection. Duke Henry himself was known for his impressive armor, complete with iron plates added to his hauberk and a grand helmet that was so ornate you could spot it from miles away. As for battle tactics, Henry kept things straightforward. The knights and squires formed the center, with infantry flanking them on the sides. After the archers and crossbowmen had fired a few shots, the cavalry would charge in. But let me tell you, chaos was a constant companion on the battlefield. If the commander lost his grip on the situation, panic could set in, turning a well-ordered assault into a frantic scramble for survival. One minute you could be on the offensive, and the next, you'd be fleeing for your life. On the other side, Orda and Baidar, two Mongol commanders, were closing in with a cavalry force of 10,000 warriors. Claims of 100,000 Mongols are a stretch, considering the logistical nightmare that would pose in the 13th century. With limited infrastructure and supply lines, supporting such a massive force would have been nearly impossible. Leading the charge was a diversionary force, a group of one to two Tumans. These Mongol horse archers were nothing short of a tactical marvel. They moved like the wind, their arrows flying with the swiftness of a tornado, only to retreat just as quickly, making it seem like they were fleeing in panic. But it was all part of their fooling strategy. Much like Hannibal's infamous feigned retreat at Cannae, which lured the Romans into a fatal overextension, the Mongols would pepper the enemy with arrows until they were worn down, then striking with lightning speed from the sides or behind when their foes were disoriented and vulnerable. The Mongols had communication figured out too. Their commander would climb to the highest point to survey the battlefield, waving flags and issuing precise orders to his Noyans and other leaders. This was a world apart from the disarray often seen among European knights, who charged into battle with little coordination. Equipping a European knight took a whole village of peasants toiling away, while the Mongols were ready to roll at a moment's notice. Their nomadic lifestyle had turned them into expert archers, and their hardy horses required minimal upkeep, making them perfectly suited for the rigors of battle. To spread chaos and seize the upper hand, Baidar and Orda made a daring choice. They divided their forces into smaller raiding parties. This wasn't without its risks, considering their army was already on the smaller side, but it was a calculated gamble aimed at overwhelming their enemies with swift, unexpected strikes. Baidar, full of determination, led the charge toward the Polish capital of Krakow, leaving nothing but destruction behind him, burning villages, looting homes, and spreading terror among the frightened locals. As Baidar drew near to Krakow, panic swept through the city. Most citizens fled into the nearby woods, desperate to escape the impending doom. According to legend, during this frantic evacuation, a lone trumpeter took his stand atop a tower, valiantly sounding the alarm to warn his fellow townspeople. Tragically, his bravery was cut short when a Mongol archer silenced him with a single deadly arrow. The Mongols, relentless in their pursuit, launched a coordinated invasion of Central Europe, striking at key locations throughout Poland. By early February 1241, their first group had stormed through the land, capturing strategic cities like Lublin, and Sandomirs. True to their tactics, they split their forces once more, one group heading north and the other south. By late February, they had ransacked and burned Krakow, a once thriving city that now stood deserted, its inhabitants having sought refuge in the forest. On March 24th, Baidar ordered the city set ablaze, leaving nothing but ashes and memories of devastation behind. 
To this day, the people of Krakow honor the memory of that brave trumpeter, a symbol of the alarm sounded during those chaotic times. The city's fire department commemorates his sacrifice by having a trumpeter play from the four corners of the cathedral tower. But the call always ends abruptly, a poignant reminder of the lookout who fell to a Mongol arrow. After wreaking havoc on Krakow, Baidar and Orda plan to regroup at Breslau. However, when Baidar arrived, he found the town completely abandoned, with the residents having taken refuge in the safety of the fortified castle. Before Orda could catch up, Baidar made the decision to lay siege to Breslau. But soon, scouts brought troubling news. A Polish army led by Duke Henry the Pious of Silesia was gathering at Legnica, about 40 miles away, with King Wenceslas of Bohemia on his way to bolster Henry's forces. Realizing the urgency of the situation, he needed to prevent these two Christian armies from joining forces. Baidar quickly abandoned the siege. He sent word to Orda, insisting he join him at Legnica without delay to intercept the threat posed by Henry and Wenceslas. With time slipping through their fingers, the Mongol commanders prepared to exploit every chance they had to keep their momentum and extend their reign of terror across the region. The scene was set on a broad plain, flanked by small rivers, a perfect stage for the tactical showdown between two very different armies. Duke Henry divided his forces into five sections, blending mounted archers with foot soldiers. This tactic might have weakened his initial thrust, but it also left him with reserves, just in case those wily Mongols attempted their classic trick of feigned retreat, only to whip back with a sudden counterattack. At the front line, Henry positioned fighters from Germany and across Europe, bolstered by local farmers and miners who had been hastily rallied into service. The first unit was led by Count Boleslav de Poldovich of Moravia, affectionately known as Shepyoka. His forces included Moravian knights, Teutonic knights, and a contingent of miners from Zwatoria and Lvovek. Right behind them came the Polish knights from Krakow and Opole, followed by the stalwart Teutonic knights, ready to lend their might to the cause. The second division was commanded by Sulisław, filled with knights hailing from Krakow, Sandomierz, Wanchicza, and Sierats. Meanwhile, the third division under Mieszko Su the Fat, Duke of Opole and Rachibors, added even more heft to Henry's battle line. The 4th Division, led by Popo von Osterna, the Grand Master of the Teutonic Order, brought seasoned knights from Lower Silesia and Greater Poland to fortify the ranks. While Henry had his Silesian knights and a handful of mercenaries waiting in reserve, the exact role of the Teutonic Order was a bit fuzzy, suggesting there may have only been four distinct lines in play. On the Mongol side, the strategy was classic and well rehearsed, employing a T formation. They spread their light cavalry and archers wide, creating a vast space that allowed them to unleash their signature surround-and-strike tactics, which had decimated many foes before. The battle erupted as the first line of Polish cavalry charged bravely at the Mongol vanguard, pushing them back and igniting a spark of hope among Duke Henry's troops. For a fleeting moment, it seemed that victory was within their grasp. Seeing this brief moment of triumph, Henry decided to send in the rest of his cavalry hoping to capitalize on their momentum. The Polish troops began to gain ground, forcing the Mongols to retreat. However, in a crucial misstep, the Allied cavalry pressed the chase too far, leaving their infantry behind and vulnerable. Just when it felt like victory was within reach, chaos erupted in the Polish ranks. A Mongol warrior, seizing the moment, shouted, Run! in Polish, sending a wave of panic rippling through the cavalry. Duke Henry, witnessing the turmoil, famously exclaimed, Gorza nam się stało, essentially declaring, we are in a bad spot. In the midst of this confusion, the prince, commanding the Polish forces, bravely stepped onto the field to restore order. He rallied his men, halting their panic, and began to turn the tide against the enemy. Yet the Mongol leader wasn't about to let that slip away easily. In a stunning move, Orda ordered his troops to set fire to the tall grass on the battlefield. The smoke billowed thick and choking, filling the air with a foul stench that obscured the Christian army's vision. For the first time, the Mongols turned the environment into a weapon, clouding the sight of the Polish knights and leaving them disoriented. The Mongol horsemen wasted no time, unleashing a relentless storm of arrows upon the dazed Polish riders. 
With smoke thickening the air and panic creeping into their hearts, the cavalry found themselves at a severe disadvantage. In an instant, they were overrun, leaving only unarmed peasants on the flanks, exposed and utterly defenseless. As the Polish wings frantically tried to retreat, they were mercilessly cut down. Duke Henry was besieged from all sides. In a brutal twist of fate, a spear found its mark, piercing the vulnerable gap beneath his armpit where his armor provided no shield. He collapsed to the ground, and the Mongols were upon him in a flash, driving two arrows into his body before dragging him away from his men. The scene was grim as they severed his head, stripping away his insignia, leaving his lifeless form exposed on the ground. Meanwhile, the unfortunate assistant knights, caught in the chaos, struggled to retrieve their fallen leader but were powerless against the onslaught. Some say he was still alive when the enemy fighters dragged him away and decapitated him, though others believe he was executed only after the battle was over. Those who tried to run were caught, killed, and beheaded. The Mongols brandished the gruesome trophy of Duke Henry's head on a spear, parading it defiantly before the defenders of Legnica, attempting to force them into submission. But despite this grim display, the Polish resolutely held their ground. Eventually, Henry's head was sent back to Batu Khan's camp, while his wife, Anna, was left to face the heartbreaking task of identifying her husband's body. Stripped of armor and clothing, it was a difficult sight. Yet she recognized him by a peculiar mark. Henry had six toes on his left foot. He was laid to rest in the Church of St. James, now a garrison for St. Vincent in Ratswa. When his grave was opened in 1832, those six toes confirmed the identity of the long-lost Duke, though his skull was sadly missing. The exact toll of the Battle of Legnica remains murky, shrouded in the chaos of battle. The Mongols had a rather unusual method of counting their dead. They collected the right ears of the fallen to keep track of the casualties. Legend has it they filled nine sacks with those grim trophies, but the true number of Mongol losses is lost to history. The invasion had devastating effects on Silesian and Moravian towns, many of which were left nearly deserted in the wake of destruction. Yet, nature offered some reprieve. Forests and marshes provided shelter for Polish peasants, enabling them to survive the Mongol onslaught. In response to the decimated populations, local rulers later brought in German peasants to restore these communities. While the Battle of Legnica was undeniably a clear victory for the Mongols, it came at a steep price. Their casualties significantly hampered their ability to sustain the campaign, particularly with King Wenceslas's army still posing a formidable threat. Recognizing the gravity of the situation, Wenceslas strategically withdrew to gather reinforcements from Thuringia and Saxony. Upon regrouping, his forces encountered the Mongol vanguard at Klesko, now bolstered by fresh troops. With this newfound strength, Wenceslas's army launched a counteroffensive pushing back against the Mongols and forcing their vanguard into retreat. Baidar and Orda, realizing their already diminished army lacked the strength to confront King Wenceslas head-on, opted for a tactical retreat. They split into smaller contingents to conduct raids in Moravia, before making their way back to Hungary, where they would rejoin the main Mongol forces under Subutai and Batu. They shifted south to join Subutai for a decisive push into Hungary ultimately leading to the pivotal Battle of Mohi. While they emerged victorious, the triumph at Legnica represented only a minor success within the broader scope of their campaigns. However, the defeat of the Polish forces, alongside the death of Prince Henry II, left an indelible mark on the collective memory of Silesia, Poland, and Europe as a whole. In recognition of this significant historical event, commemorative activities at Legniki Pole serve as annual reminders of the battle's impact. The event, titled Legniki Pole 1241, You Could Lose Your Head Here, features reenactments that not only honor the fallen, but also educate the public about the profound historical significance of the Battle of Legnica. These observances keep the memory of those who fought alive, ensuring that the lessons learned from this encounter resonate through generations. In the 13th century, the Mongol Empire, under the leadership of Genghis Khan and his successors, was rapidly expanding across Asia, bringing unprecedented military and political changes, while the Mongols conquered vast territories from China to Eastern Europe. They also directed their attention toward the Indian subcontinent. During this time, 
Punjab and northern India were seen as prime targets because of their wealth and resources, agriculture and key trade routes, especially Delhi. Delhi was a major trade hub connecting various important regions. Merchants from all over the world, from Central Asia, the Middle East, Europe, and Southeast Asia flocked to Delhi to exchange goods. Indian products like cotton textiles, silk, spices, and precious metals were traded for horses, weapons, silk, and luxury items from distant lands. Delhi's markets were always bustling with diverse goods coming from different regions. The trade port near the Yamuna River facilitated the flow of goods, making Delhi a crucial stop along transcontinental trade routes. One of the most attractive sectors for traders was the silk and cotton textile industry, which flourished during this period. Fabrics like muslin, a soft, fine silk, and various cotton and woolen textiles from India were exported to faraway places like Persia, Egypt, and even Europe. And of course, all that wealth ignited the Mongols' ambitions. Unlike India, they didn't have a flourishing agricultural society or complex village systems. They didn't also have fixed cities. Instead, they moved freely and used war as a key tool to expand and maintain their power. Their goals were simple. Take away tributes and treasure from the kingdoms they had conquered and take from them the latest technology. In addition, capture beautiful women for their harem and the most able-bodied men for their military. The Mongols didn't just invade, they wiped out entire civilizations. To give you an idea, during Genghis Khan's invasion of the Persian Empire in 1222, millions were killed in major cities. One million in Urgench, 700,000 in Merv, 1.7 million in Nishapur, 500,000 in Ray, and 1.6 million in Herat. Altogether, that's nearly 6 million people from just those cities. It's said that during this campaign alone, the Mongols killed around 1.5% of the world's population at the time. So, when Indian dynasties faced the Mongols, they were up against an army that wasn't just strong and brutally savage, but one that approached war with an entirely different mindset. And the later battles between them would probably have hardly happened if the Mongols had not set foot on Indian soil for the first time under very special circumstances. It all started in 1221, when a Mongol force chased Jalal al-Din Mangburni, the prince of the defeated Khwarezmian Empire, into Punjab. The Mongols fought his army there, and although Jalal al-Din escaped, his forces suffered heavy losses. After this battle, the Mongols decided not to push further into India to find Jalal al-Din due to the unfamiliar terrain and tough conditions, so they returned to Central Asia. But the Mongols didn't forget. In the following years, they regularly raided northern India, especially Punjab, forcing the Delhi Sultanate to divert massive resources to defense. In 1241, a Mongol army captured Lahore, one of the Delhi Sultanate's key cities, shocking the court since Lahore was an economic and strategic hub. Then, in 1245, they seized Multan, putting even more pressure on the Sultanate. During Sultan Mahmud Shah's reign from 1246 to 1266, Delhi was in a state of chaos. India was a vast land with diverse cultures, religions, and ethnicities. Hindus, Muslims, Buddhists, and Jains all coexisted, making it hard to maintain control. Social classes often rose in rebellion against Muslim rulers from the north. While the Delhi Sultanate ruled over much of northern India, other regions like the Rajput kingdoms remained independent. These Rajputs fiercely resisted Sultanate rule, engaging in long, drawn-out conflicts. On top of that, places like Gujarat, Bengal, and the Deccan were also fighting to maintain their autonomy from Delhi. The constant conflict didn't just destabilize the region, it opened the door for foreign invaders, especially the Mongols. By this time, the Mongols were becoming more and more of a threat along India's borders. Although Mahmud Shah was technically in charge, the real power was Giyas Uddin Balban, a clever vizier who had broken the Mongol siege at Uch in 1246. He thus became the most influential figure in the court, which prevented Mahmud Shah from fully controlling political and military affairs. Balban quickly realized that the tribute system Mahmud Shah used to appease the Mongols was failing, and the northern attacks weren't letting up. He decided the Sultanate needed a shift in strategy. So, what did Balban do? When Balban came to power in the mid-13th century, he adopted a more aggressive and assertive policy in dealing with the Mongols. Balban 
reformed the existing army by recruiting more soldiers, not only from the slave class, but also from the freed warriors, creating a more diverse military force. Balban focused on providing the army with more modern equipment, from weapons to armor to improve its fighting ability. As the army grew stronger, Balban also launched strong counterattacks, recapturing Multan and Lahore from the Mongols, restoring the Sultanate's prestige. One of Balban's wise decisions was to accept and welcome refugees from Mongolia, Persia, and other Central Asian regions. In the 1260s, when the Mongol civil wars broke out between the Ilkhanate and the Golden Horde, two of the major Khanates that had formed from the division of the Mongol Empire after the death of Genghis Khan, many warriors and nobles fled to Delhi. Balban adopted them into the Sultanate's army, giving him the opportunity to gain valuable knowledge of Mongol military tactics. This not only strengthened his army, but also equipped him with new tactics, improving Delhi's defenses. By 1270, Balban went to Lahore and ordered the construction of strong forts on the frontier. A series of strong forts were constructed there and strong armies were kept therein, and this is a very remarkable point in the reform of the military defense of India. Perhaps they had learned a lesson from the Mongol invasions of Europe. A typical example was the first Mongol invasion of Hungary. With a terrible defeat, Hungary lay in ruins. Nearly half of the inhabited places had been destroyed by the invading armies. Around 15 to 25% of the population was lost, and widespread hysteria spread across all of Europe. But the most remarkable thing here is that well-fortified castles were impenetrable to the Mongol army, given that five stone castles located east of the Danube survived the invasion. It proves that the Mongols could not easily conquer the fortified fortresses. This reinforced Balban's view that the construction of fortresses was an important strategy in defending the Sultanate. The fortresses were built with thick, high stone walls, watchtowers, and elaborate defenses, including traps and dugouts. The fortresses were built in locations that were easily observed and defended, allowing early detection of Mongol attacks. After a few years, the northwestern frontier of the Delhi Sultanate was split into two regions for defense. Prince Muhammad Khan was tasked with guarding Multan, Sindh, and Lahore, while Prince Bugra Khan was responsible for Sunam and Samana. However, when Bugra Khan was appointed governor of Bengal, the entire responsibility of defending the frontier fell to Prince Muhammad. Balban's defensive strategies were highly effective, as they managed to keep the Mongols from advancing deeper into India. In 1279 CE, the Mongols launched an attack on Delhi's territory, but Prince Muhammad successfully repelled them, forcing their withdrawal. In 1285, a larger Mongol force launched a major offensive on Punjab. Prince Muhammad bravely faced the Mongols in battle, but was tragically killed. Although the Mongols plundered Lahore and Deepalpur, the regions of Multan and Uch were successfully defended. The defense measures put in place by Balban ultimately held strong, and the Mongols were forced to retreat once again. Balban spent the rest of his life in shock at his son's death and died in 1287. This was followed by the rise of the Khalji dynasty in 1920 under the founding of Jalal al-Din Khalji, who defeated a Mongol army at Bahram in 1292. But in 1296, Jalal al-Din was killed by his own nephew, Ala al-Din Khalji, who seized power with the help of two key commanders, Uluh Khan and Zafar Khan. At the same time that Ala al-Din Khalji was ruling India, Dua Khan, alongside his son Kutluk Khwaja, ruled over the Chagatai Khanate, one of the Mongol Khanates that formed after Genghis Khan's death. Dua Khan was particularly ambitious about expanding his territory southwards in India, much like his predecessors. There were two main reasons for Dua Khan to invade India. One was that he could not ignore a rich land with a paradise for trade as I mentioned in the beginning. The second was that India was the only direction in which the Chagatai Khanate could expand without conflicting with other Mongol Khanates. Thus, during the reign of Ala al-Din Khalji, a Mongol force raided Punjab in the winter of 1297 to 98, but was defeated and forced to retreat by the general Uluq Khan. Not long after, a second invasion attempt was also stopped by Alauddin's other general, Zafar Khan. Now, you'd think that might have been enough to discourage the Mongols, right? But no, it only made Dua Khan more determined. After this humiliating defeat, 
Dua Khan launched a third, fully prepared invasion, with the intention of conquering India completely. In late 1299, Dua, the ruler of the Mongol Chagatai Khanate, sent his son Kutlug Khwaja to conquer Delhi. The Mongols intended to conquer and rule the Delhi Sultanate, not merely raid it. Therefore, during their six-month-long march to India, they did not resort to looting cities and destroying forts. At night, they were harassed by Delhi generals deployed at border posts such as Multan and Samana, but they always avoided confrontation with these generals, as the Mongols wanted to preserve their strength for the big showdown in Delhi. The Mongols set up camp at Keeli, just about 10 kilometers from the outskirts of Delhi, and word of their arrival spread quickly through the region. As news trickled in, people from nearby villages began to flock toward the safety of Delhi's fortified walls, seeking refuge from the approaching storm. But here's the twist. It seems that Alauddin Khalji didn't catch wind of the Mongol invasion until they had already crossed the Indus River. Can you imagine the panic that must have set in? Without wasting a moment, Alauddin sprang into action. He quickly sent urgent messages to his provincial governors, calling for reinforcements to defend the capital. It was all hands on deck. Setting up camp near Siri, right by the banks of the Yamuna River, Alauddin gathered his officers for a crucial strategy meeting. His uncle, Alaul Mulk, suggested that maybe they should consider diplomacy and negotiate with the Bongols, instead of risking everything in battle. After all, it was a smart play, right? But Alauddin wasn't having any of it. He argued passionately that showing any sign of weakness could undermine his authority and make his people lose faith in him. Therefore, he publicly declared his intention to march to Keeli and fight the Mongols. And now, two forces finally confronted on the bank of Yamuna River. Mongols brought between 50,000 and 60,000 horsemen with them, while the Delhi army took around 70,000 with 700 elephants. Both forces deployed in the standard formation for steppe armies, a center and two wings. The Mongol forces were led by Kutluk Khwaja, who commanded the central wing of the army. The left wing of the army was commanded by Hijlak, likely a seasoned commander with expertise in cavalry maneuvers, crucial for the flanking strategies Mongols often employed. The right wing was under the leadership of Tamar Buga, another experienced Mongol commander. These flanking wings were essential for encircling and outmaneuvering the opposing forces on the battlefield, a hallmark of Mongol military tactics. In addition to the main army, a unit of 10,000 soldiers was positioned in ambush, under the command of Targi. This hidden force was likely intended for a surprise attack, to strike the enemy when they were most vulnerable, exploiting confusion and disorder in the heat of battle. The Mongols' strategic placement and the use of ambush tactics were critical elements of their overall battle strategy, which often relied on mobility, speed, and the element of surprise. Despite these efforts, the Mongols faced stiff resistance from the forces of Alauddin Khalji. The left wing of the Delhi army was led by Nusrat Khan, a prominent general also known as Wazir of the Sultanate. It consisted mainly of cavalry, whose speed and maneuverability were crucial for outflanking Mongol forces. Their mobility allowed them to execute swift attacks and avoid prolonged engagements. On the right wing, Zafar Khan commanded a mixed force of cavalry and archers, as well as Hindu warriors. The cavalry engaged the Mongols directly, while the archers weakened the enemy from a distance. The inclusion of Hindu warriors brought diversity in combat tactics, adding depth to the defensive line. In the center, Alauddin Khalji himself led elite cavalry, the backbone of his army. This unit held the most critical position, defending the heart of the army against the Mongol charge. Alauddin's direct leadership inspired his troops and ensured the army maintained its morale. Ahead of the center, Akat Khan commanded the vanguard, tasked with absorbing the initial Mongol assault, while Ulug Khan, leading the reserve unit, provided reinforcements to wherever Mongol pressure intensified. This structure ensured a dynamic and flexible defense against the formidable Mongol cavalry. Moreover, the elephants were stationed in front of each division to act as a buffer against the Mongol assault. The Delhi army stretched over several miles, making it difficult for Alauddin to control it centrally. Therefore, he issued a strict order that no officer was to move from their position without his instructions. The punishment for the violation of this order would be beheading. However, 
The battle started when Alauddin's general Zafar Khan attacked Hijlak's unit without Alauddin's permission. When the two sides are in conflict, Hijlak's force fought back weakly, and then suddenly retreated. Zafar Khan, driven by his relentless courage and confidence, pursued Hijlak's retreating army, covering an exhausting distance of around 55 kilometers, leaving most of his forces, his infantry, and slower cavalry far behind. This seemed like the Mongols had no strength to fight back, but this was actually one of the Mongols' most notorious tactics, the feigned retreat. This strategy was designed to lure their enemies into a false sense of victory, and then trap them. When Zafar Khan finally realized the trap he had fallen into, he was left with only 1,000 horsemen by his side. But the situation worsened rapidly. Targi with his unit ambushed Zafar Khan from behind, and now blocked his return to the main camp of Aluddin. It's a bad situation. You might wonder why no one came to help, right? Well, some say it was Aluddin himself punishing Zafar for ignoring his orders. Aluddin wanted to delay the battle, hoping the Mongols would run out of supplies or reinforcements would arrive from the east. But Zafar, being bold, rushed ahead and ruined that plan. Then there's Ulug Khan, who was just sitting back, doing nothing. The thing is, this wasn't just about battlefield tactics. It was personal. See, Zafar Khan had earned massive fame earlier by pushing the Mongols out of Sindh, while Ulugh Khan and Nusrat Khan were off in Gujarat dealing with their own battles. Zafar's victory put him in the spotlight. This success made both Alauddin and Ulugh Khan jealous. And according to Ziauddin Barani, a historian of the time, who even suggests that they might have been plotting against Zafar, with talk of blinding or even poisoning him to cut short his rise in fame. Zafar Khan knew exactly what kind of battle lay ahead the moment he realized he was surrounded by Mongol forces. But he didn't flinch. He gathered his officers together. And right then, they made the decision. Every warrior dreads, but knows deep down is sometimes necessary. There would be no retreat. In their eyes, to flee was not an escape, but a disgrace. They knew Alauddin Khalji well. He would never forgive them for showing cowardice. So, in that moment, they embraced their fate. They would fight until the very end. Not because it was the only option, but because it was the most honorable one. As the fighting intensified, Kutluk Khwaja saw the heroism and resilience of Zafar Khan and his men. He admired their spirit. So much so that he extended an offer to Zafar surrender, and he'd be taken to the Chagatai. Kanate. Not as a prisoner, but with honor. Now, most people would probably have accepted that deal, knowing there was no chance of victory. But Zafar Khan wasn't like most people. His sense of loyalty to his sultan, his pride as a warrior, and his unshakable commitment to Delhi meant that surrender never happened, and he outrightly declined the offer. In the chaotic, fierce combat that followed, Zafar Khan and his 1,000 horsemen fought with exceptional bravery. According to contemporary accounts, they killed around 5,000 Mongols, a remarkable feat given the overwhelming odds. But the price was heavy. Zafar Khan's forces were decimated, leaving only 200 men standing at the end. In the final moments of the battle, Zafar Khan made his last stand. With his horse cut down beneath him, he fought on foot, face to face with Higlak. In a dramatic duel, Zafar Khan engaged in hand-to-hand -hand combat. But his bravery was not enough to change the outcome. He was struck by a well-aimed arrow that pierced through his armor and found his heart, bringing an end to his courageous stand. Zafar Khan's son on the left wing wasn't just sitting idle. He took up the mantle and led a fierce charge, forcing Tamar Buga to retreat. But he wasn't about to let them off so easily. He and his forces pursued the Mongol army as they pulled back, despite being hit by a barrage of arrows from the retreating soldiers. At the same time, the Mongols made a move on the center of Aladdin's army, hoping to break through. However, Aladdin's division stood firm and pushed them back, causing significant Mongol casualties. The death of Zafar Khan, though, was a heavy blow to the morale of the Delhi officers. When morning came, Alauddin's advisors urged him to fall back to Delhi, suggesting that it would be safer to defend from the city's fortifications. But Alauddin, confident in his strategy, rejected the idea. He believed Zafar Khan's forces had suffered because they disobeyed his orders. He made it clear, if they were to move, it would only be forward, not back. 
As for Kutlo Kwaja, the Mongol commander, he seemed hesitant to launch another attack. The second and third days of the standoff ended without any major fighting. Then, under the cover of night, the Mongols decided to retreat toward their homeland. Alauddin, seeing the Mongols pulling back, allowed them to leave without further conflict and then returned to Delhi victorious. However, Dua Khan was not satisfied. In 1303 AD, he again sent a large force of 120,000 cavalry to attack Delhi under General Teragai. Caught off guard and weakened, Alauddin quickly fortified his defenses around Siri, relying on natural barriers like the Yamuna River and the ruins of Delhi's fortifications. He dug trenches and built strongholds, successfully holding off the Mongol siege for two months until Taragai retreated in frustration. In 1305, the Mongols attempted another invasion with 50,000 troops. But after the death of Taragai, Alauddin dispatched 30,000 to 40,000 cavalry under Malik Nayak, resulting in a crushing victory for Delhi. By 1306, Dua Khan launched a final assault, but Malik Kafur defeated the Mongols decisively at the Ravi River in Nagore drastically reducing their forces. Thus, Alauddin Kilji achieved what no other ruler in the world, whether Eastern or Western, had ever achieved. He repeatedly repelled and defeated the large-scale invasions of the Mongols, who became an unstoppable force wherever they went. Russia, China, Persia, Iraq, Syria, Europe. From the knowledge of how other countries fared under the Mongols, it can be said that if the Mongols had conquered India, India would have been set back at least two or three hundred years in its development. A large part of the knowledge and culture that had been accumulated in India over the millennia would have been destroyed. Every library, school, temple, mosque, and even home would have been burned down. Thus, the Mongols were unlike any other invader. If the Mongols had won the Kilji, they would have wiped a large part of India's cultural heritage off the map of the world. If we have ancient traditions in India that have survived to this day, a large part of the credit for that must go to Alauddin Khilji, one of the greatest warrior kings in history.